everyone. Welcome back to another week of Bulletproof Hygiene Podcast. I'm so excited to have you joining us today. And I want to acknowledge, I know it's been a minute since I've had a new episode out. Um, the last few months have had me really focused on some really fun speaking engagements and prepping for our annual Bulletproof Summit, which we just had last weekend. And it was phenomenal. Um, we had really great energy, really great connections between teams, really helping people find fulfillment in what they're doing and digging into their teams and building that community and that collaboration. So I want to say, if you have FOMO, if you missed out, um, I want to encourage you to set your sights ahead looking toward next year. We are currently working on dates and location as we speak, and you should be hearing that from me soon so that you can get it on your calendar and also talk to your doc and your team about it because the magic of Bulletproof comes through bringing the whole team and creating synergy, collaboration, and community. You guys know dentistry is a team sport. We've got to do this together and to, to do it well and to succeed. So if you are regular listeners of mine, you know that I stand on a very big soapbox of the oral systemic connections and our responsibilities in that direction. And we know that we are up against a host of microbes the individual immune response, and the multitude of host factors that determine how perio may manifest in each patient. And it's just crazy to me to consider that you can have the same pathogens present in two different patients' mouths, but they will look completely different. There's just so much to consider. But it's also crazy to me that for so long, we have determined our treatment plan based off of the destruction and breakdown that has already happened instead of what is actually driving that destruction, which honestly we know is the immune response, but it's those microbes that turn on that response. So how are we making a treatment plan if we don't even know what microbes are present? So I'm back at it talking about salivary testing because I believe that's where dentistry is going. Honestly, I really think that's where we're already at. The question is, are we willing to get on board with the latest technology? and learn and grow and stretch ourselves and be a little uncomfortable for a minute and open to those opportunities to help our patients achieve true health. When we can actually see what is present and the actual root cause of what's driving the inflammation and infection, that's when we can really consider the best course of action and achieve true outcomes. And then we can post-test after treatment to ensure success or determine if we need to do something more or different. And for so long, I was personally focused on the bacterial component of gingivitis or periodontal disease. And obviously that is a huge consideration, but certainly not the only microbe in the attack. We know that periodontal disease and gingivitis is a polymicrobial biofilm infection. And I wanna reference back to a previous podcast. If you missed it, I want you to go back and listen to episode 131. Lions, Tigers, and Candida with Megan Barnett. It is She is a fabulous functional nutritionist. And if you missed that episode, I, re I recommend checking it out or giving it a second listen because I think it brings so much credence to our conversation today with Dr. Dave Vigorist. And I am so excited to introduce you to him today. He is the co-creator of the salivary test that we are talking about today, Simply Perio. And Dr. Vigorous received a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry from the University of Texas at El Paso, a master's degree in microbiology and immunology from Texas Tech University, and a doctorate in cellular and molecular pathology from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He, is conduct he conducted his first postdoctoral fellowship at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Infectious Disease and completed a second postdoctoral fellowship at Vanderbilt University Medical School in the Department of Pediatric Infectious Disease and the Center for Vaccine Sciences. He was a full-time faculty member in the Pathology, Immunology, and Microbiology Department at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and a health research scientist in the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. He remains an adjunct assistant professor at Vandal Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in the Department of Neurological Surgery and graduate faculty at the University of Kansas. Most recently, Dr. Vigorous has served as the Chief Scientific Officer and VP of Immunology and Clinical Affairs for several diagnostic laboratories focused on precision medicine in oncology and cardiovascular medicine, genomics, chronic disease prevention, and infectious disease. 
He has authored more than four dozen publications in national and international journals and is an active and is an active as a speaker, reviewer, and editor. He has developed several novel molecular diagnostic assays for the prediction of inflammation and cardiovascular risk in patients with diabetes, infectious disease, and cancer. He speaks often on the subject of precision medicine, oral systemic health, and immunology, and has previously been selected as a TED, TED Talk speaker. He has spoken to AOSH, you guys know I'm a fan, um, and done work with Bale Deneen team for the last 10 years. And in his recreational time, he enjoys cycling, golf, kayaking, and spending time with family. So Dr. Vigorous, we are so excited to have you joining us here today um, and talking about your work and your passion. Tell me a little bit about how this came to be with you developing, I know you co-created this test that we're talking about today. Tell me kind of what was the uh, catalyst for that. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> You know, as you mentioned, I've, I've been working with uh, Brad Bale and Amy Donine for, for a number of years now, and there's been a very strong interest and in <clears throat> influence from them in oral, system, oral systemic health. So what we wanted to do was to try to build an assay that had the most clinical utility and, and the most meaning to the clinician, whether it's a physician or a dentist. And in this case, <clears throat> we really tried to work hard to try to get that collaboration between the dentist and the clinician um, physician, right? Whether it's prevention physician, cardiologist, um, endocrinologist. So <clears throat> we've worked really hard over the last couple of years to bring together what we think is the most comprehensive test for both the medical and the dental providers. Yeah, I love that. And this, this podcast today, you guys haven't heard me talk about this before, but this is the new salivary test that has come to market that I am currently using in my practice, and it's called Simply Perio. And I'm loving this test because it gives me so much information beyond just the bacterial pathogens. And we're able to see a much bigger picture and have better intel on what's going on and how we should approach care. So I want to do a quick rundown of what this test is looking for. Um, I know it's looking for nine different bacterial pathogens, the four from the red complex, uh, four of the orange complex, Privatella intermedia, Campylobacter rectus, Fusobacterium nucleatum, and Fusobacterium animalis. And then it looks for Iconella corrodens from the green complex. It, carry, it has a carries risk aspect, detecting strep mutans, which we know drive decay, but it also detects strep sanguinis, which is the good commensal bacterium associated with healthy plaque biofilm. It detects the presence of candida albicans, which is so important because we know if yeast is present, it can collaborate with the bacteria, creating more pathogenesis, but it also can encase and protect the bacteria. And lastly, it identifies four viral targets to determine if herpes simplex one or two, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus are active which we know can impact our patient's immune response. So Dave, what I would love to do with you today is kind of dig into each of these aspects with you to help us understand why these targets were chosen to help our listeners understand how knowing all of this information helps us as clinicians. So will you help us understand these components and the levels of specificity, specificity for each? Okay, so, so for the... The, the bacterial components we're all kind of more or less familiar with. Right. I mean, they've been described for many years. We know that the, you know, the purple, red, orange, and green complex have been uh, reported by others. They've been, they've been in the literature quite extensively. Um, Canada is, is something that probably many don't, don't realize has an impact. And Canada albicans is probably the biggest player, but there's several other subspecies of Canada that are also participating. In the future, we will include some of those subspecies as well. And then the viral targets, um, quite often I get a lot of questions about the viral targets. Why do we include viruses? Um, who, uh, how do these viruses impact your periodontal health? How do they impact your dental health? And what most people don't realize is that the, the literature around this is probably 25 years old. And, and this happens quite frequently in medicine where the, the a application of something is two or three decades behind the research. 
And so there's some fantastic researchers from USC that have very thoroughly described the role that EBV, CMV, and, and HSV1 and 2 have in oral um, dysbiosis and oral infection. And, and really there is, there's a synergism. There's a viral bacterial, bacterial synergism that occurs between those red and orange complex organisms and these herpes viruses. Now, most people probably, well, I'm assuming most people realize that we are almost universally infected with these herpes viruses by the time we're in our teens. So, you know, the idea that you are you have a herpes virus at one point or another would have been kind of semi-scandalous, right? Oh, right. you've got HSV-1 or HSV-2. But, but these are ubiquitous viruses that all of us get exposed to very young in life. And it, it's kind of the effect of having a family, right? You know, grandparents come over and they've got to see the, the grandkids. They've got, to, they've got to kiss on the grandkids. They've got to hug the grandkids. Christmas, Thanksgiving, all of the holidays, there's family around. And so these herpes viruses are very communicable and they pass from one family member to another. And really, by the time we're in our late teens, we're almost always 95 to almost 100% seropositive. So most of the time, that doesn't mean anything. You know, the vast majority of us have these viruses. We don't suffer any consequence from them. Occasionally, you get a cold sore, or you have, you know, maybe mono or something like that. And it's, it's a relatively innocuous sort of infection. It's a nuisance, but it doesn't it doesn't debilitate us. But what these researchers at USC showed is that there's some synergism between those viruses and the periodontal pathogens. And what those viruses allow is they allow for a number of advantages to the bacteria. Uh, one of them, like you mentioned, is it's a measure of kind of our immune response. When we are a diminished immune response, these viruses take advantage of that and they will resurface and they live in our nervous tissue, right? So EBV and CMV and HSV1 all live in the nervous tissue. So quite often, like when you get a cold sore, it's because these viruses are living in the trigeminal nerves and you get stressed and they express themselves and you get a cold sore. And the idea behind that, without giving the virus a human quality, is that the virus wants to spread to someone else. So it it senses a it senses a problem with the host. And when I was teaching, I would always say that, you know, it, it's almost as if the virus thinks that you're going to die because you're under stress and it needs to get to a new host, right? It needs to find a new home. So it expresses itself. It's hopeful, again, not to give them qualities, human qualities, but it wants to go to a new host and survive, right? Um, so when we are when our immune system is diminished, these viruses come come to the surface. They they get a selective advantage, but one of the things that they do is that they the reflection of our diminished immune response, and these bacteria take advantage of that diminished immune response. But the other thing is these viruses also help to upregulate adhesion molecules and other things on the epithelial surface that allow the bacteria to to better adhere. So along that gum line, along the tissue line, if you have these increased adhesion molecules, then the bacteria have a better chance of sticking. They're less likely to be removed by debridement, by brushing and flossing and those kinds of things. And if your immune res response is diminished, then you're not actively fighting them, right? You're kind of trying to fight on multiple planes. Correct. And if you have the bacteria going and you have the fungus going and you have the virus going, your immune system is trying to battle on three different fronts. Correct. And those three different fronts may not be directed equally. So maybe it's it's assessing the threat and going, well, the bacteria is probably the bigger threat right now or the virus is a bigger threat. So it, it devotes resources and effort to that and allows these other organisms to flourish because they're not being adequately uh, um, targeted. Yeah. So what we wanted to do was to give the clinician a picture of all of that, not just the bacteria, which right. is important, 
not just the candidate, which is important, but we wanted to give them also this assessment of how the immune response is currently operating. And the virus is a very good barometer of that. It helps us to understand if your immune response is strong and healthy and adequate, the viruses are, are kept in check, which means that most of that energy is directed against the virus, or I'm sorry, against the bacteria and the, the yeast. Right. We don't have the yeast, then your, your efforts are directed solely against the bacteria. And what research has shown is that about 40% of people with periodontal disease have a yeast infection also. And it's not obvious. You can't look in your mouth and see signs of thrush. You're not going to see, you know, the kinds of things that you would normally associate with an, with an immune deficiency and these bacteria. So like folks that have HIV and stuff, they're very diminished in their immune response. Right. And you can very clearly see that they have a, a thrush. They have a Canada infection. It's because they don't have any other mechanism for fighting it. But when you've got these three or these three classes of organisms all kind of vying for, for space and superiority, your immune response cannot effectively target all of them. So by giving this full picture of bacterial, viral, and fungal, we're trying to give the clinician some insight into, okay, do I need to treat with an antifungal to get that down? Do I need to treat with an antiviral to get that down? And then I'm going to aggressively treat the periodontal pathogens to try to improve tissue health, to try to preserve an implant, to try to make sure that there isn't an abscess or anything else. Because once you get the viral and the fungal away, then you can really address the, um, the bacterial insults that are occurring there. Because we know that the antibiotics that you would use to treat periodontal disease are not effective against the viral and the fungal targets. Right. And, so, yeah. and is it is it, it's my understanding I've heard that uh, if you do have that fungal aspect, it almost acts to encase that bacteria and protect it from trying to use an antibiotic. It does. It there's a shielding of there's a shielding effect that happens when you have that the candida. Now Canada albicans is probably the the larger component of this. Okay. There are two or three other subspecies of Canada that are important as well. And when we designed this assay, we expected it to be kind of a phased approach. Um, there are some clinicians, some dentists who are really expert in this space and they know how to handle it. They know what to do when they see the results. But then there are some that are still learning. They're, they're still trying to, trying to integrate salivary diagnostics into their practice. And I, we didn't want to give them so much information that they didn't know where to where to direct their efforts. Correct. So this first this first evolution of the test includes 16 targets, which we felt was kind of on that line of enough, but not too much. Got it. Um, and then the next version would would include some expanded subspecies of the Canada. It would also include the, the next version that we have coming out is going to include uh, another gram negative organism that's important in periimplantitis. Okay. So if you're doing implants, the recommendation, at least as far as we're concerned, is that you do a salivary test to find out if your patient's infected. What are they infected with? Let's clear the infection as much as possible before we do something invasive like putting in an implant. Right. And the rationale there is the last thing that a dentist or provider or even a patient wants is to have all that work done and then have it all pulled out again and then have to wait five, six months or whatever it takes to get the tissue and the bone healthy enough to come back in with the implants. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense to, to make sure that you're ensuring a good outcome for, for you as a clinician and for your patients and their investment and their health. Sure. I mean, this yeah. is... I mean, dental care is expensive. Yeah. Uh, especially when you come in with multiple implants and root canals and bridges and, and everything else that goes along with it. It's it's a fairly uh, expensive, time consuming. Um, and you really want to make sure that you have the highest degree of success possible. And the only way to do that in our mind is to do testing. Yes. Just like you would on the medical side. Yes. I mean, you would never go to your doctor see your doctor and he goes, well, I think you have high cholesterol. Right. Let's, let's put you on a whole battery of drugs and see what happens. 
Um, all of that, I mean, 80% of medicine is based on diagnostics. Correct. You, your decision-making is based on a test. That hasn't been the case in dentistry. I mean, you get x-rays and you get, I mean, physical observation and pocket depths and things like that, which is all extremely important. But there's no way you can look in someone's mouth and say you're infected with X, right. right? Right. You have to do the test. You have to see what the test results show you in order to make an informed decision on what's next to do. Yeah. Talk to me. So one last question on the viral piece. So if you get a negative result on the viral piece, it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient doesn't have the virus. It just means that it is not currently active. It's in a dormant state. Is that correct? Correct. So, okay. so going back to what I mentioned before, we are all universally positive correct. for these viruses. Herpes viruses are ubiquitous in the human population. And it would be surprising to me if you could just randomly go out and pick somebody and do a serology test on them, which is to taking blood and looking for antibodies to see if they've ever been exposed. And I would wager that out of a hundred patients, you probably would be hard pressed to find one that was negative. Yeah. Um, th these viruses are just, they're pervasive. Yeah. And, and it's not a behavioral issue. It's not a, it's not like Correct. you've been wrong. It's not right. like you could have done this and that. It's that these viruses are, are, everywhere in the environment right and no matter how healthy you are no matter you know what what your approach to life is we're all universally infected with these viruses right and, you know it's always been kind of a stigma oh your herpes infected but you know there are you know there are nine herpes viruses yeah um, and the majority of them don't cause us any issue i mean they live with us they live in us occasionally they they cause a cold sore or, or you know a mono you know mononucleitis but but they don't usually lead to anything significant unless we're a transplant patient or you know or even as a child i mean the, there's a, there are occasions where you know in utero or during delivery a baby gets exposed to cmv because the mother happens to be active at the time of delivery and the baby has no immune response. Right. right. I mean, they have no defensive mechanisms at that point. So they'll get they'll get a retinitis. They'll get you know, but those are all those are all correctable, right? Correct. They're all treatable. Yes. So um, when you tell somebody, and I've heard this from a number of clinicians, well, I can't tell my patient they're herpes positive. So well, you're not telling them that they did anything wrong. You're just right. telling them that a virus that all of us have every single one of us, the dentist included, the hygienist included, yep. the, the, the people at the front desk, everybody in the office waiting room, they're all positive for this. Uh, you just happen to have it active today. Yeah. Uh, and what that means is that that's impacting whether or not these bacteria and the fungus that you have potentially are more virulent and more active than they would had you not been positive at this time. Right. And so this test is not looking for antibodies. It is looking for active virus. Everything we're doing on this particular test is a nucleic acid test. So we're okay. checking to see if you have active infection. Um, now, the sensitivity of PCR, which is the technique that we use, means that we could still pick it up if you had been positive and active two weeks ago. Okay. Right. The nucleic acid is probably still circulating in your bloodstream. It's still circulating in your saliva. It doesn't mean you're positive today necessarily, but it means you were positive within a short time window of that sample. So um, that's that's both the good and the bad of PCR. The sensitivity means that you may have been active and positive last week, but we're still going to pick up on it this week. Got it. And eventually, you know, you'll filter all of that out, but it takes a bit of time for your immune system to fully clear everything out of out of the out of the bloodstream and the saliva. One other thing that's very different to me about this test that I haven't seen before is you differentiate specifically between the Fusobacterium nucleatum and the Fusobacterium animalis. So talk to me about why that decision was made. 
So we're the only test right now that does that, that discrimination between nucleatum and the sub subspecies of, of animalis. The reason for that is we are very, we, we've got a very strong mindset towards systemic health. And one of the things that animalis has recently been associated with, there's a particular clade, so a subset of animalis that has been associated with colorectal cancer. So if you carry this particular organism, and as we know, we swallow probably somewhere between a liter and a liter and a half of saliva. And that's always kind of a funny thing to, to students. You know, like when I tell you, you're swallowing like a liter of saliva. I'm like, really? I said, well, think about it. You're sitting here in class and you're continuously swallowing throughout the class. What are you swallowing? You're swallowing saliva. You're swallowing everything that's in the mouth. All those organisms that are actively growing, they're replicating, they're being swallowed, they're going into your gut. And the animalis has been, at least recently, uh, as, as recently as about a month ago, was associated as being inside the colorectal polyp. So we know that some of these organisms have an effect outside of the oral cavity. Right. Porphyromonas, certainly we've talked about in the past, porphyromonas being affiliated with the cardiovascular disease. If you take someone who had a heart attack or somebody who has a plaque and you section through their blood vessel where the plaque is at, you can find active live porphyromonas inside that plaque. Uh, if you go into somebody who has Alzheimer's, somebody who has neurodegenerative disorders, and you look inside their brain, you can find active bacteria. And many of those bacteria trace back to the oral cavity. Right. So it can be porphyromonas, it can be fusobacterium, it could be Prevotella. It can be, there's a number of them that find their way into the brain, but they likewise find their way into the gut. And depending on whether or not you have leaky gut or any, any of those other issues with your GI tract, they can extravasate from the gut and into the bloodstream and then move off to any place in the body. And they take up residence in those places. So we know that they contribute to diabetes. We know that they contribute to neurodegeneration, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we know that they have an impact on fatty liver disease, which is, I mean, most people don't even hear about fatty liver disease, but it probably is two to three times more frequent than diabetes. And of course, we hear about diabetes all the time, right? Right. right. You should get your blood sugar checked. You have to watch out for this, watch out for that. And, you know, uh, NASH and NAFLD, and they've got a new moniker for it now. It's metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And those things are all impacted by what happens in your mouth. So it's extremely important. Even if you're, if you go, well, you know, I, I don't brush my teeth every single day. I don't floss. I don't do this. I don't do that. And you think that it's just contained to your mouth, but it's actually contained to your entire body. Correct. It's, if you're ever worried about cancer, if you're ever worried about losing your losing your cognition, if you're worried about your liver, then you have to be worried about your mouth. And, 100%. Yeah. You know, a, a hundred years ago, Charles Mayo, who was the founder of the uh, Mayo Clinic, said that, and he's a physician, very prominent physician at the time, said that the future of medicine was in the hands of the dentist. And now we're starting to see that that the dentist, the, the oral care provider, hygienist, everybody who's involved in that whole, um, that whole process has an intimate role in keeping their patients healthy throughout the entirety of their life. Not, not just that they have a good smile and clean right. breath, but that their heart works, their brain works, their kidneys work, their liver works, their gut works. Um, everything that comes into the gut has to come through the mouth. Right. Yep. It is the gateway. Talk to me specific specificity wise. So PCR test, um, what, at what point is this detecting these levels? Is it? Well, theoretically PCR can measure down to one copy. Okay. Okay. One copy is probably not relevant, right? Got because it. you have one copy, Correct. an organism in your mouth. I mean, right. okay. that doesn't mean much. Uh, because the reality is that these organisms that contribute to periodontal disease and systemic disease are part of our normal flora. We live with them right. all the time. Just, just like we live with some of these nasty ones in our gut, 
you know, C. difficile and E. coli and Shigella and Salmonella, they live in our gut all the time. They're just maintained in a balance Correct. with the good ones. So the good ones we have in our mouth, keep the bad ones in check. The good ones in our gut, keep the bad ones in check. So, you know, theoretically, PCR can go down to one copy. That's not clinically relevant to you. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to set our thresholds for sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and precision. So those are the four things that you care about in a test, in a diagnostic test, that we can go down low enough to tell you this is clinically relevant. We can tell you that these organisms are associated with disease, not just that they're there right. and not doing much, but they're associated with disease. We can distinguish them from each other, right? So I don't, you don't want a result that I tell you, well, there's a 50% chance that what I'm telling you is right. You want a 99.9%, right. right? So so that's where that's where the specificity and the sensitive sensitivity come from. The the problem in the kind of the community is that people think that sensitivity and specificity means we can go really low and we can't, but the clinical definition of specificity and sensitivity is, do you, can you pick up an organism that causes disease and do you not pick up the organism when there's no disease present, right? So, so that's the thing. So here's, here's the conundrum that we have. If you have periodontal disease and I measure one copy of porphyromonas, right? I still measured it, but you don't have disease. Correct. So that's a little bit of a fuzzy spot between the specificity and sensitivity. Got it. As compared to somebody who says, if I measure this, if I measure this compound, we only find it in breast cancer. So if I find it, you have breast cancer. If I don't find it, you don't have breast cancer. Got it. Right. So that that's a little bit of the fuzziness in in some of this is that people assume that the sensitivity and specificity is only to how good can you detect it. Got it. But it also has to be if I detect it, do you have disease? Because I don't yes. want to if I tell you, hey, you have porphyromonas, that could be one copy, it could be a million copies. One copy, no disease, a million copies, disease. Right. right. Well, on that front, let me ask, because I've had a few results come back on my patients, and I know there's kind of an upper limit, that upper measuring limit. So tell me if 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 I've got that going on in someone's mouth, is that just, they're just off the charts? Well, our upper limit on our particular test is just short of 1 billion okay. copies, right? Okay. So we're looking at 10 to the eight. Right. So that's hundreds of millions of copies. If you have a hundred million porphyromonas, I'm going to guarantee you, you have some right. form of periodontal disease. Right. If you have five copies of porphyromonas, I'm going to assume that that's part of the normal flora, not contributing to disease, but it's still present. Got it. So uh, it's it's that range. So what, what you get in our test is you get a range. So everything in the green is basically going to be that five copies, right? It's there. Got it. It's there. It's not probably contributing to disease unless you have four or five other targets also expressing, but it's present. Now you as a clinician could decide, I want zero copies of PG or I'm okay with five copies. Right. I'm okay with 10. I'm going to test you again in a month and we're going to see if it moves one way or the other. If it moves in a direction I don't like, I'm going to treat you with whatever is appropriate, whether that's ozone or lasers or right. RP or whatever, right? right? That's up to you as a clinician to decide where you're comfortable with that range. But, you know, we're going to show you probably those low copy numbers in green. We're going to show you the ones that, hey, this is probably within a range that you should be mindful of. It could be contributing to disease that you see. Uh, or, or it's on the it's on the verge of moving to a place that's going to be problematic. Got it. Um, and you know the thing about the about the test results is that's one piece of information. Right. 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 You're you're going to see the patient. You're going to be measuring pocket depths. You're going to be yeah. 
looking at other clinical signs, redness, bleeding, all kinds of other things. So you may see a patient who has perfectly healthy looking gums and perfectly healthy looking oral cavity and go, mm, they've got a million copies of PG, but they look okay. They don't look bad. That's up to you as the clinician to decide, right. I'm going to get ahead of this. Right. Or I'm going to watch this and we're going to see what happens in two weeks or in a month or whatever. Right. Um, that's a question we get sometimes too is, well, how often should I test? Should I test, let's say I, you take a baseline test today. Should I test them again in two weeks? Should I test them in three months? I think three months is probably too far out. If you see anything that might be clinically relevant, you know, right. they, they have 5,000 copies of PG. Okay. That might be something we want to watch, not just three months from now, but maybe a month from now. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I typically try to do like a four to six week post treatment test mm -hmm. to see how we're moving that needle. Right. Right. And, and if, if it stays stable, then right. you go, okay, well, fine. It didn't move. We didn't get any worse. We didn't necessarily get better, but we didn't get worse. So let's, let's go three more months or two more right. months. Right. Right. But um, there's one other aspect of this test that I think is super cool and exciting. And again, that I haven't seen in another test all put together like this is the um, carries risk assessment piece. And so I just want to help our listeners understand kind of what to look for on that front. Um, I love that you included, you know, the mutans, which we know drive that decay, and then the sanguinous, which is the good healthy commensal that we need to have overwhelmingly. So talk to us a little bit about that aspect. So we, we wanted to offer something that was um, more across the board. It didn't, wasn't just directed to periodontitis. And, and we know that, you know, if you're looking at pediatric patients or teenage patients or even, you know, um, anywhere along the age spectrum, that one of the things we're concerned about is caries and, and decay. So Having on that same report, that same test, having the strep mutans, we know they're a major driver of, of decay. And um, sanguinous is a protective bacteria, right? So they they basically work against each other, right. for lack of a better term, right? So if you have high degrees of sanguinous, generally you usually have very low levels of mutans. So we wanted to offer that as a guidance also that you know, not only are you worried about gum health and everything else, but is this a patient who has a tendency to harbor bacteria that are going to promote more, more decay? And, you know, there's a, a whole host of products on the market that are really effective against mutans that you don't have to go to back. You don't have to go to antibacterial right. antibiotics to do, right? Right. But, toothpastes and rinses and all kinds of things, you know, xylitols and everything else. But, you know, we wanted to be able to offer somebody more than just periodontal disease. We wanted to offer them immune response. We wanted to offer them caries. In the future, we'll add on inflammatory markers so you can see what the status of your inflammation nice. is. Nice. Uh, but again, it's it's part. it was part of that stepwise yes. mentality is if I gave you all of this together, you'd be overwhelmed. Right. Well, well, the majority of people, I mean, like right. I mentioned earlier, there are some people who are very well-versed in the space and I could give them all 50 markers and they would know where to run with it and do everything, right? I'm sure if I gave you the full 50 markers, you'd know what to do with it. But if I bring this to a, to a new dentist who's just out of school, or if I bring it to a dentist who's really not, not you know, gone into this, this space very much, then the 50, 50 markers is overwhelming. We did some work to try to figure out, well, what's the right sweet spot? Yeah. What's too much? Well, what's enough? Th this is what I love about technology. As we grow and learn and, you know, we, we have new opportunities. And I'll say that for me, that this is a newer test for me that I'm really loving. You know, I've, I've had experience. I've used oral DNA. I've used HR5. So I've understood. I've had a chance to kind of grow and understand the pathogen, the bacterial portion of it. But now I'm, you know, there's times where I'm treating patients and I'm not seeing the outcome I want. And I'm like, now I can see more. Is there fungal? Is there viral? Like, it's really helpful to see that. So I love that. I love the thought of maybe uh, doing some uh, inflammatory markers in the future. Right. But so one thing I do want to say about this test is very easy to use. 
Um, it's packaged really well. Each test box comes with all the components needed. Um, and a very important part is that this test does utilize a preservative liquid that suspends the microbes for up to 30 days. So it ensures true results. It doesn't allow for any growth or proliferation of the sample as it's being shipped. So you get a true result for what's going on in the patient's mouth. And then each box is set and ready for shipping and can be dropped in your nearest postal service box or home mailbox, which is what I do. So it makes it really easy. Um, there's no refrigeration required. Results are back within a week. And the cost of the practice per test is currently at 90. Um, and obviously you determine what you wanna charge your patients. You know, I think it ranges anywhere from 125 to 175. Um, but I want to tell you listeners to check out a sample of a test to see what this looks like and to get more information. And I will uh, link this to the show notes, but visit simplytest.solutions. Um, there's a wealth of resources. Uh, there's a really great section, resources slash studies to review in the science and resource section, um, which I've kind of dug into. There's a lot of great studies um, and articles there to help you understand these links and why these pathogens on this test or virus or candida are on this test. So if you feel like, oh, I need some support around this and I do have some things to learn, the website's really, really great at doing that. Um, so Dave, I know, like you said, you guys are considering maybe next step would be including some inflammatory markers, but just curious because you are a microbiologist and this is how your brain works. Like, where do you see this testing going in the future for us? Uh, we're going to continue to evolve this. There's more pathogens than just these. Right. There's more inflammatory markers than what's on the market now. I mean, principally, I'm a microbiologist and immunologist kind of hybrid. Right. So I spent a lot of time in host response to infection. How does our body respond to these insults that, that occur from bacteria, viruses, and whatnot? So we're, we're going to continue to evolve this to be at the leading edge of technology and the leading edge of research. What you mentioned, we have a very large body of peer-reviewed evidence. So you don't take my word for it that these, are, that these pathogens are relevant right. uh, or important. We have all of the literature there for you to make your own decision. And, and it's, it's listed out by organ systems of so cardiovascular, brain, heart, uh, not heart, cardiovascular, brain, kidneys, liver, uh, gut, everything is there. And you can make your own assessment and judgment. But we know that there's going to be a need for more insights. And, you know, this is the beginning. We're going to continue to evolve this and try to make the best product we can give to clinicians. Because the better the product we can provide you, the better treatment you can provide to your patients. So, um, yeah, I don't know where it's going to end up. It, it, ultimately, uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to continue to be able to provide um, good tools, good diagnostic tools, highly effective, highly accurate, highly sensitive and specific tools to the providers so that you can make the best judgment you can for your patients. Yeah, um, I love that. all of us, all of us at Spectrum and at Allometrics, which is our um, our our testing laboratory is. Our goal is to do everything we can to help patients get healthy, to maintain their health, to have a good life, to have a, a long life, right? You know, everybody is interested in longevity now, and a lot of longevity comes from how do you manage the different organisms that are coexisting with us, keeping them in check, but also benefiting when possible, right? So the sanguinous, we want to try to support that. Right. Um, there are other pathogens that are good, not pathogens, but other commensal bacteria that we'll be adding to this test also. So not only do we want to tell you what's all the bad stuff that you have in your mouth, but we want to be able to tell you, hey, this is all the good things you have going. Right. You know, you yeah. have healthy bacteria that are providing, you know, vitamins to you, providing all of these extra nutritional supplements. There was a recent... Um, uh, recent discussion that, you know, bacteria populate the majority of our surfaces, right? Inside, outside, and they produce something like 3 million different products. Many of those products are things we need. Right. We can't make for ourselves. 
you know, so B, B12 is a good, is a good example of that. We have bacteria in our gut that produce B12 for us. Without those bacteria, we would be vitamin deficient. So I think we need to also be providing well, what's good. Yeah. What are you doing sure. that's good, that's supporting your wellness, supporting your health, providing you with vitamins and nutrients, but also, you know, supporting those good bacteria that help to compete out the bad ones because they're always going to be there. It's part of our normal flora. Yeah. It's part of our, it's part of our complement. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. And we need to sort of make sure that the good ones stay in, in, um, in dominance and the bad ones stay in check. And that helps us to keep our, our health and wellness for a long and healthy life. Yeah. I love it. I always say it's crazy how alienistic it is that we have so many more microbes than we do have human cells, but we absolutely need those. So I, I used to tell students that when they look in the mirror, what they see is 10% human and 90% bacterial or 90% um, microbial. microbial, microbial. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. What? It's crazy. Really? So yeah, it's just, we have so many, so many organisms coexisting with us and helping us to get through life that if we became a sterile organism, we wouldn't survive. We need right. them, but we need them in the right balance and we need them in the right concentration. And um, the next version or two of this test will give you some insight of, well, how are you doing on the good stuff, right? When you go to your doctor, you just, you just don't want to hear about, well, your cholesterol is bad. Right. You're not exercising enough. You're not doing this. You want to go, oh, okay. You're 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 good here. You're good here. You're good here. Right. You walk out going, I've got some things to work on, but I'm overall pretty good. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. As opposed to going out of the doctor's office going, oh, everything I do is bad. <laughs> Everything's bad. You know, nobody yeah. wants nobody wants the negative insight. They want, okay, we could do better here, but you're doing great on this. Yeah, I agree. Well, I want to wrap up with a thought that I think there is obviously just based off this discussion, but from, from my own practice and what I've seen, there's just so much value to testing every patient in our chair. I'm hoping that's where we're moving. Um, and if we're going, especially if we're going to call ourselves preventative providers, we now have the ability to determine risks and address them prior to disease formation, which is what prevention is really about. And I'll say that from my own personal experience that we should 100% be testing anyone with bleeding present. Um, I've been amazed at what I've seen for patients who have what I would consider a mild you know, case of gingivitis and I test and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's significant bacterial component to this that we really need to get control of. Um, you know, there's, there's that thought of waiting until there's bone loss, but like I said, just too many crazy test results with early gingivitis that we got to consider what our patients are at risk for systemically. If we just go in and disrupt all of those pathogens without really knowing what we're doing. So I want to leave all of our listeners with the challenge today to check out simply perio, dig into the science and resource section and think about our roles in helping treat and prevent total health and wellness in our patients. There was always fear and uncertainty when it comes to doing something new and different, but patients rely on us to stay current with technology. They're used to going to their physicians with sore throats and getting a test to determine if it's strep. This test makes sense to them when we explain it. And lastly, our patients rely on us to do what's best and right for them and have their best interests in mind. So I would love to hear from the Bulletproof community and you guys when it comes to saliva testing. So come chat and let's have some conversation on the Mighty Network. Um, if you guys haven't joined that, it is a free download. Just look in your app store, download Mighty Network, look up Bulletproof Hygiene. It is a free way to come and have conversation. And I wanna know, are you guys testing? What wins have you seen? What's holding you back? What verbiage are you using with your patients? what wins and what's losses. Let's do this together. We owe it to our patients and can find so much personal fulfillment with actually seeing and knowing we are truly achieving health. So here's to Simply Perio. And Dave, thank you so much for your time with us today and your experience and, and what you're working toward to help us be successful in this, er this arena. Thank you very much. I appreciate being with you. All right, everybody, have a great week. Come talk to us on the network and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.